This is the Hofstra Radio Alumni Audio Yearbook, and today is November 13th, 2024. Please tell us your name and the years you were at Hofstra Radio. Jake April, I was on Hofstra Radio from September 2020 to December 2022. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us, and it's it's nice to talk to you in this way. Uh, we got to meet in person at the recent Hall of Fame induction just a couple of weeks ago, so uh, it's nice to keep the conversation going. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. McKinney. I greatly appreciate what you're doing, and it's great, as I said before, to hear all the voices that I've known before and, and put a name to a voice. All right. So let's talk about your time at Hofstra Radio generally. Do you remember what, what shows or programs or departments you worked with? Yes. I worked in the sports department. I worked on some preview shows, the fall and winter preview show. And I worked the night, the weekly show behind, oh, behind the pride. I was able to voice some things there and yeah just getting to work in the sports department it was a very humbling experience and certainly something that i'll never forget awesome that's great um did you have any titles or positions at the station i myself did not i worked at the in the sports department but i myself did not have any titles or positions Okay. Um, before we started recording, you mentioned that you didn't do a lot of on-air work, but um, certainly I'm sure working there for a few years, uh, people got to know you or, or might have mentioned you on the air. Did you always use your own name? Did you have any nicknames or personas on the air? Yeah. No, I didn't have any nicknames. I just went through my name and was able to just go by my name. I I think I was, it was pretty nice because even though for some of the time it was during COVID, we were able to communicate via Zoom. So I got to know some of my mates at RHU and it was just nice to have that community. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I, I definitely want to talk about some of that because um, you, 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 the more recent students have had this this very unique experience. So I do want to ask you about that. But let's go back to the very beginning. I like to start here and find out what brought people to the station in the first place. So that's the first thing I want to know. Or you tell it whatever order you want. But what brought you to the station? And then if you could tell us what was the station like when you first got there. I think the station was my my thoughts about about coming to the station were different than what I experienced, at least going forward. Hmm. I don't know if there's much many people that told you this, but you probably know that WRU is very competitive. So it was it was really intimidating to be a part of of RG and, and knowing that everyone that I was in contact with wanted to do similar things and and sometimes you felt left out. But as you as I got my feet wet, I realized what I was able to do and, and the contribution I was able to have to RHU. It goes back to my time at Mitchell College in New London, Connecticut, when I was actually, excuse me, the IT director of our station here. They're called Mitchell Radio. Aurania Mitchell, excuse me, and I had my sports talk show I co-hosted with a couple of my friends, and then I did some play-by-play, -play, and through that, I was able to find a niche, and 
And for those of you who don't know me, may might may not know that I have several palsy. So being able to broadcast and just focus on that, you know, when you're broadcasting and or on air or doing whatever in radio, whether it's the board or, or whatever you do, you have to be completely 100% focused. Hmm. So when I did that, it allowed me not to think of myself as disabled. It allowed me just to think of myself as a broadcaster. So going into Hofstra allowed me to hone my skills as a broadcaster and get to see what I was really talented at and continue on that path. So so when you before you came to Hofstra, were you aware of the radio station? Were you aware of its reputation? Is is that did that play in to your decision to come to Hofstra? I was aware of it and that was a big reason I went to Hofstra to hone my skills. I, I felt as though in my station previous it was great to get my feet wet and we did a lot of fun activities there and as i mentioned it was very fun to be a radio personality but i felt like there was still some parts of the education and and some parts of the structure that I was missing. So that's why I decided to go to Hofstra to hone and learn some of the structure and what the business was like from a more professional space. So uh, I like to ask this for people who have experience at other radio stations and other broadcasting facilities. Um, and, and this is not to say one's better than another, but when you got to WRHU, how did that compare to your previous ra radio station? Yeah, so my previous radio station was more of a free-for-all. It was an internet station some of the times or most of the time, excuse me, we would have automatic music playing. Not a lot of people were there to do shows every single day. And most certainly we don't, we didn't have a structure like we do at Hofstra as they do at Hofstra. But it was a nice way to get introduced to the, the, platform. I think once you, and I mentioned this before, once you get into RG, you realize what it's all about, and it can be a little bit intimidating at first, mm -hmm. but having that experience in radio before allowed me to remember that I, I really belonged where my feet were at at that moment. Mm -hmm. So, so you get to Hofstra, and uh, I guess you have to sign up for the training class. What do you remember about that? Yeah, I remember signed up for the training class, and uh, the class itself, I don't really re remember much of it, but I remember... It, like it was yesterday that when I first, although I said I didn't do much on live air, I remember one of my first times speaking to John about my talents, and that's John Mullen. And he told me that when they first accepted me, they weren't sure what I could do. And the prospect of me being on air wasn't much in the cards and he was really proud of me to be able to do that and he's gone on to be one of my biggest advocates in the industry and it's so nice to have so many people that are professional in the industry but also i get to call mentors in 
and friends. You can't do much better than having John Mullen as as a friend and advocate in this business. So uh, that's wonderful that that uh, he welcomed you in that way. And and I guess in in the training class, I know it's it's pretty intense for a lot of people. It's it's a multiple hours once a week and uh, basically over the course of the semester. At at any point, did you feel uh, like you were learning new things that you hadn't experienced before that or, or were there challenges that you didn't expect? Yeah, I think you don't necessarily realize what you're in for until you Mm. get into it. So all the things that we learned that we had to memorize in the test, like the call letter, call letters, and how to use the board and everything like that was more more complicated than I thought it was going to be. But it even made it that much sweeter when I knew how to do those things and I figured out how to adapt in my way to be able to contribute to the radio station. Hmm. So um, I, I'm assuming that John Mullen was teaching the training class. Do you remember anybody else who uh, you worked with during the training cl- class or learned from? Yeah, John Mullen, Pete Silverman, I worked with him for almost my whole time there once a week to work on my voice and be able to project and pronounce things in a in an appropriate manner. Eli Finkelstein was someone that I looked up to. Natalie Kate was some someone I looked up to. Later on, Yao Bansu, Derek Futterman, Shana, Shana, I don't know her last name, but Shane Stock. Yeah, yeah. Shane Stock, just to give, just to name a few. It was, it was so helpful to have them as mentors and, and friends. Mm. Um, that is a common theme throughout a lot of my my conversations about Hofstra Radio, whether it's your time or my time or, or, or any time in between or before, is that there's a sense of community and that people are looking out for each other. And, and there's a healthy competition, to be sure. I think you said that before, that everybody's trying to get on the air and trying to do things, but also people are looking out for each other. Is that Does that sound right? Yes, most definitely. It, it's great. I worked with the New York Islanders last year and former I'm sorry if I get emotional but former president or um yeah I think she was sports director Rachel Lucia she was just a year out of out of graduation and she was interviewing the players in the locker room and was on the pregame for show for hits and did some of the writing for the the website and I would always get to hear my peers in between periods announcing the scores of other games and all that they did in intermission and then to hear Chris King go through the lineup of people that were able to help him in that broadcast to feel like I knew those people, not only in an ancillary way, but in a deep level, it was some, it was something and it's something that's still going to stick with me today to be able to say, I knew that person when it's really powerful. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely feel that. And, and when you, when you know that your friends are, are succeeding and, and, and the people that you worked with and, and we're, we're all kind of on the same team. So that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I want, I want to go back a little bit cause we were talking about the training class and the, the people that you worked with and supported, but uh, it's, everyone says it's a tough class and you get to the end and you get approved to be on the air or to run the board. But that's another step, you know, to, to get actually live on the radio or, or running the board. 
you remember getting on the air behind the board for the first time by yourself? And, and what were you thinking and feeling? Yes, I think my first time was the music slot. I was rather overwhelmed with the board because I have trouble with both of my hands. But we, in typical RGU fashion, they helped me to the nth extent and we adapted it for me to be able to record my slots and then I would send it to Edward Mendeza at that time, who was the music director, and he would put it on for me. And just to be able to adapt in that way was was very helpful for me. Mm-hmm. So, so you got that help getting started, and, and you talked about working with the with the sports broadcast. Was there a time where you started to feel really comfortable uh, in in any capacity, whether it's on the air or be behind the the board, where you started to feel like, oh, I really know what I'm doing. I'm I'm getting good at this. Yeah, I think it was during the time one of the one of the primary times that. I remember is when we did the 2020 Olympic coverage, we interviewed some people and I interviewed a a person from the very first softball United States team in 1996. And she, her name is Coach Richardson. I don't remember her last name, uh, her first name, excuse me. But when I did that and I got feedback from her that she kept on saying, what a great question, what a great question. That's great to hear, but also learning from Pete about what is a good question and hearing it myself, I felt like I belong there. Wow. Wow, that's very cool. And that and that's so I'm just doing the timeline because you said you started so that would have been early on, maybe in your first few months or, or maybe about uh six months into your time at WRG, was that right? Yes, I believe so. That would have been there and it is something that I truly remember and and won't forget that experience for a a long time. Absolutely. Now, um, a slightly different question, I think, because of the time period you were there and because of, of, of COVID and the restrictions and the distancing and things like that. Um, a lot of people find that getting started at the station, one of the things that's very helpful is the social aspect and that people are, are friendly and helpful and, and, and go out of their way. But, but your beginning time, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly how it falls, but, but there would have been restrictions on uh, you know, everybody getting together. And, and did that affect you getting socially comfortable at the station? Yeah, the meetings that were usually held, all staff meetings and all the shows were remote. And it was definitely an adjustment period. But as I said before, my mentors and people after me and I was able to do, hopefully able to do the same for the pe- or the people before me that did for me, made it comfortable for me. And I would, hopefully was able to do the same for the people after. But that was all the mo- more important because we weren't able to, to connect in person. But whatever we were doing, we were sure to keep in contact and group chats and and really really do as much as we could with all that we had and i believe bruce avery who passed away unfortunately Hmm. said that for about two weeks the station was running or it might have been uh it might have been a month or so this was before i got there but for about Two weeks to a month, the station was running on autopilot, but then they all figured out how to do, how to do everything remotely. So it just shows you 
the expertise of RHU and, and the real dedication that they had to make sure that the community would bond despite not being with each other in person. Mm. Well said. And, and I've heard other people say the same thing. It's, it's amazing when creative, dedicated people get together and, and, and have a mission and, and get things done. But, but once you, you're, you're started at the station and, and, and you're getting through the training and, and you're getting comfortable on the air. And I guess that's when, when about the time people are coming back to campus and, and starting to be around each other. Was, did that sort of meet your expectations of what you thought the station would be? Or, or was it a, a different feeling once everybody was back uh, on campus and at the station together? I personally thought that it was more comforting, I think, in an aspect. Because when you have the online platform, it's one thing to be online and, and create the community that we had, but it's another thing to be in person. And innately, everyone took advantage of being in the in the radio station, so you would see all the smiles and and all the all the bright faces that were just so excited to be in there and it illuminated throughout the room even though most of us had to wear masks yeah it's funny you get used to uh, you, you figure out people's expressions even with the mask on from their body language and their eye movement so that's 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 really interesting. Um, you you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the the first time doing the music show, and and some folks helped you out to so you can manage the board and set up your tracks and things like that. Um, were were there similar things when you were working with the sports department or doing games that that you worked with the team or or other people to help you get comfortable to make sure that you were able to do the things that you wanted to do? Yes, I remember in some of the packages when I had trouble creating, writing the package. They would all Zoom with me and make sure I understood what to do. And if it came towards that late time where I didn't really have much time to learn, they were able to help me. But I remember Tom Bauer taking so much time to help me and really everyone took great time to help me to learn everything that was has to do with the radio station. Mm. Um, you mentioned at your previous radio station at, at, at Mitchell Radio that, that you were uh, doing some IT stuff. Is that right? Were, were there other uh, technical things that you were interested that you were able to do at Hofstra Radio? Well, in Radio Mitchell, there, it was very small, so the positions, there was only a few of us that wanted to really dedicate our time to to the radio station, so that was just a position that was picked out for me. I, okay. I always wanted to be on air. I think... I shouldn't say I, I think, but I remember the first time actually going to Radio Mitchell and seeing what they did in a talk show. And I did it for a long time until I, I made my appearance because I, I didn't know how I would be treated or how my voice would sound on the radio. And I remember having a talk with actually Ned's radio broadcaster, Chris Carino, mm -hmm. and he has muscular dystrophy. And he said, well, if they're gonna give you the opportunity take it. So he really helped me 
feel comfortable in my own skin and then to get that opportunity there and then to get the opportunity along with the education that Hofstra gave me was all the more better. As I said before, I think the two were a great combination of the two to really lead me into success. Hmm. Hmm. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. And, and it's, it's really just, just amazing your journey. Um, this, this might, we might have more time for this in another conversation someday if, if, if you want to talk more. But uh, when we spoke in person at the Hall of Fame induction, um, we, we talked about uh, a particular alum that there, there's uh, an award named after. Um, and I wanted to put that out there and, and just get your, your feedback or your thoughts. So if I say the name Mark Wiener, what does that mean to you? Yes, unfortunately, I, I did not get to know Mark on a personal level. But I know he was always a forward thinker and always willing to help it from what I could hear and, and see on other people's expressions. It was looked like he always cheered for the underdog and, mm -hmm. and to be able to get that recognition from him and, and his wife was something that I really treasured and, and not only to get recognized by him, but you need to be considered. So to be considered and, and elected by the community because of John Mullen, John Mullen's suggestion was, was truly something that was humbling and Pete Silverman once again wrote a word of recommendation for me. So it's truly humbling to to be able to see how I was able to make an impact from not really knowing if I was going to be on the radio to winning awards for what I've done at the radio station. So it, it's very, very humbling and and the experience that I'll definitely never forget and hold on to the connection for an infinite, an infinite amount of time. Hmm. Hmm. I, I, I'm so glad you said that and, and made those connections because as, as you were talking about learning things and, and working with different people and figuring out what worked for you and how to be part of the team, it, it made me think of Mark uh, partially because of, of all the many, many years that he spent at the station. That was always a big part of, of what he did is, is problem solving and being creative and being interesting. And whether it was working with Jeff Krause or doing a, a show with Butch D'Ambrosio or, or just being around and fixing stuff and planning stuff. And he was just, just such an interesting person. And then when the Mark Wiener award was created from, from time to time, I've been fortunate enough. Uh, Sue has asked me to be a judge for, for, some of the Mark Wiener awards and the Jeff Krause awards. And, and I remember coming across your resume and your information and, and your story and the recommendation letters and just being so impressed and so interested in your story. And I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful that we got a chance to meet in person and we've had a chance to, to have this conversation because I, just from everything I got from then and from, from talking to you now uh, you seem to get that spirit of, creativity and community and problem solving and and just and i think we haven't really talked about this but just having fun like being at the radio station and having fun and doing interesting things with cool people it's it's just so interesting and i'm i'm, I'm so glad we've able been able to have this conversation yes thank you that's one takeaway that i will forever take away and often have to remind myself that this is a profession that I'm going into, but I originally did it because it was so fun. So mm. just to remember the lightheartedness that I got into this with and, and keeping it with me for the time, hopefully the long run that I'm in journalism for is just going to be that much more rewarding and, and, that much more easy to celebrate when 
things like the Mark we know or come and I get elected for something like that. So thank you very much, Mr. McKinney. This was a great half an hour or so to spend with you. I'm, I'm very humbled to have met you and, and to have been involved in such a illustrious radio station. And it's something that I will never forget and the relationships that I've had I'll hold on to for forever. So thank you for the time today. Uh, Jake, I, 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 I greatly appreciate your words, but I, I must insist because you're making me feel older than I am. Please call me Brian. And, and Mr. McKinley is for my high school students. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I appreciate I appreciate the respect and and I so much appreciate uh, your your time and your story and um, I'm gonna send you another list of questions because I have a, I have another round and uh, hopefully you have some more stories you wouldn't mind sharing. We can do this again. Yeah, most definitely. I know I'm not done. If I know I have so much, I had so much to learn at WRU and now I feel like it's my time to. Pay it forward. So anytime you want to have me back on the show would be my pleasure. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. This was great fun for me as well.